Suzuki Ishiro, an exhausted programmer working on multiple game projects and tirelessly fixing bugs, finally succumbs to sleep after over 30 grueling hours. However, when he awakens, he is astonished to find himself standing on the precipice of a fantastical canyon. To his amazement, his reflection on his cell phone reveals his high school face, adding to the bizarre nature of his surroundings. Floating before his eyes is a game-like interface, reminiscent of various games he has worked on in the past. Intrigued, Suzuki realizes he can manipulate the interface with his mind, and his name appears as Situ in the status section, his in-game alias from previous beta tests. Curiosity peaked, Situ opens the map and discovers he is situated in the Dragon's Valley. Suddenly, a cloud of smoke emerges in the distance, signaling the approach of enemies. Realizing the impending danger, Situ searches the interface for tools to combat them. To his surprise, he finds three meteor rains and a map reveal, a concept he had previously devised to aid new players. Utilizing the map reveal, Satu learns that there are 300 formidable lizard people enemies, all at level 50. As a mere level 1 gamer, he realizes he cannot face them head on and takes cover behind a wall. However, much to Satu's astonishment, the lizardmen spot his hiding spot and rain a volley of arrows upon him. One of the arrows narrowly grazes his eye, drawing blood and causing Satu to feel the searing pain of potential demise. Desperate, he attempts to employ the meteor rain from the interface only to panic when nothing happens. Frustrated and fearing his impending death due to programming bugs, Setu unleashes the remaining two meteor rains in rapid succession. To his relief, a deluge of meteors cascades from the sky, obliterating the lizardmen. When the rain of destruction subsides, Situ realizes that one lizardman survived the onslaught, though it stands on the brink of defeat. In a surprising gesture, the lizardman passes Situ his sword, challenging him to a final battle. Strategically, Satu blinds the lizardman with sand conjured from the ground and defeats it by hurling the sword. Much to his amazement, all of his wounds miraculously heal, and he discovers that his level has risen to 310, courtesy of the meteor rain's devastating effect on the lizardman. Moreover, his maximum vitality in the status menu increases accordingly. Examining the interface further, Satu realizes that his ability points have reached their maximum capacity. He also notices that the meteor rain and reveal map abilities in the magic skill section were initially disabled, but he now has the option to activate them. Eager to test their potency, Satu enables the abilities and launches a meteor rain at a distant location in the valley. To his horror, the meteors prove excessively colossal compared to their previous size. Realizing the catastrophic danger, Satu flees for his life, managing to cross a protective veil that shields him from the explosive shockwaves. Bowing to disable the dangerous spell, he breathes a sigh of relief. Feeling parched, Satu accesses his inventory through the interface, discovering an array of loot and a considerable sum of money acquired from slaying the lizardman. Quenching his thirst with an infinitely filled water pouch, he takes out robe-like garments from his inventory and dresses in them. Later, by the campfire, Satu peruses the skills section, discovering that skills can be acquired through observation and experience. Realizing his limited skill set, he allocates points to those abilities most useful in battle. Empowered and armed with newfound skills, Satu sets his sights on the warrior's fort, pinpointed on the system map. Upon reaching the fort, he witnesses a level 30 wyvern menacing the low-level soldiers. Seizing an opportunity, Satu hurls a rock at the wyvern, redirecting its attention toward the soldiers. Determined to assist, he gives chase. As he draws near, he struggles to comprehend the soldier's conversation, prompting him to maximize his language skill through the interface. With newfound understanding, Satu observes the soldier's futile attacks bouncing off the powerful wyvern. Suddenly, he witnesses a magician named Xena being launched into the air by the wyvern weakened by her feeble spell. Without hesitation, Satu leaps off the cliff and catches the unconscious Xena in his arms, ready to confront the perilous challenges that lie ahead. Earning the honorable title of Savior, Satu comes to understand that his actions not only grant him skills but also titles. After waking up, he is greeted with gratitude by Xena, who expresses her appreciation for saving her life. Xena proceeds to introduce herself in great detail, leaving Satu wondering if he should be privy to such personal information. However, his thoughts are interrupted when he narrowly evades a crossbow bolt. He realizes that Xena is accompanied by her companions Iona and Lilio. Filled with suspicion, they interrogate Satu, prompting him to rely on his acquired skills in persuasion and trickery to deceive the two girls successfully. By spinning a tale of being a traveling merchant who lost everything due to a phenomenon known as starfall caused by falling meteors, Satu manages to convince Lilio and Iona of his fabricated identity. The scene transitions and Satu finds himself en route to Salyu City. During the journey, Xena and her companions provide him with insights into the value of wyvern hide and scales, as well as the unappetizing taste of wyvern meat. They also inform him about the presence of both slaves and magical beings in the city, with only a single elf residing there. Upon entering the city and parting ways with Xena, Satu acquires his identity documents by paying his silver coin with Iona's assistance. To his surprise, he discovers a stone called Yamato that displays his status, but realizes that it reflects his status prior to leveling up. This revelation brings him comfort as he understands that it is a feature of the interface. 
Subsequently, Satu obtains a 10-day visa to stay in the city, learning that if he overstays, he risks becoming a slave. As Satu separates from Iona and begins walking, he is approached by a girl named Martha, who leads him to the Gate Inn, the very establishment recommended by Iona. There, he pays for his stay and enjoys a meal, gaining skills in haggling and trading. Engaging in conversation with Martha's mother, the inn owner, Satu learns of rumors involving a demon lord challenging dragons in the Dragon's Valley. He also discovers that a hero had previously defeated a demon lord, contemplating the pattern often seen in games where a defeated demon lord revives to launch another attack. Satu ponders the possibility of a similar scenario unfolding in this new world. As he relishes the delicious quich and bok choy-like cabbages, Satu engages Martha in conversation, inquiring about where he can purchase general supplies. Martha not only provides helpful information but also offers to accompany him to the recommended shops. Grateful for her assistance, Satu accepts her offer and together, they set off on their shopping excursion. During their journey, Satu witnesses the harassment of two demi-human children and promptly intervenes to protect them, driving away their tormentor and offering his support. After bidding farewell to the children, Satu rejoins Martha, who explains the unfortunate prejudice faced by demi-humans due to their history of pillaging from farmers. Continuing their shopping spree, they eventually make their way back to the inn. Along the way, Satu notices a slave named Arisa, adorned with the titles of an exiled witch and a crazy princess. Once they arrive at the inn, Satu encounters a young girl named Rumi and expresses his gratitude by giving her a tip for assisting with his luggage. He then seeks Martha's recommendation for dinner and indulges in a sumptuous meal, savoring each bite and even requesting seconds. Following his satisfying feast, Satu retreats to his room and reclines on the bed, reminiscing about all the experiences he has encountered thus far and what he perceives as a dream. However, a sudden realization jolts him upright, as he comprehends that this might be an entirely different world, considering the absence of a save or logout function within the interface. Driven by curiosity and a desire to gain knowledge that would benefit him as a game creator, Satu ventures out to explore the city, taking in its sights from a cliff overlooking the bustling streets. The scene transitions to the following morning, with Martha waking Satu and informing him that his girlfriend has arrived. Intrigued, Satu goes outside and is pleasantly surprised to find Xena, who expresses her intent to guide him on a tour of the city. Satu expresses his gratitude to Xena for accompanying him on the city tour, and they indulge in various snacks during their exploration. At a stall selling bat wings, an accident results in Xena staining her shirt. Fortunately, a mage approaches and offers to use magic to remove the stain, an offer they gladly accept. As they continue their tour, Satu's curiosity leads him to ask Xena about the path to becoming a mage. He discovers that it is a challenging journey, requiring the mastery of difficult chance and years of study from a young age. Xena shares her dream of one day flying through the air using magic, and Satu offers his encouragement. While purchasing skincare ointment for Martha's mother, Xena asks Satu if there is any particular place in the city he would like to visit. The scene transitions as Satu and Xena find themselves standing atop the city wall, relishing the refreshing breeze. Satu seeks Xena's approval before suggesting a visit to a military facility, to which she assents. They then proceed to the Palin Temple, a stop along the way to the windmill that intrigues Satu. There, they encounter Orna, the priestess of the temple, who enlightens them about the hero's sword, which emits a blue glow when accepting someone worthy. After bidding farewell to Orna and taking one last look at a portrait depicting the battle between the hero and the demon lord, Satu checks his titles while Xena arranges for a horse-drawn carriage. Satu is taken aback to discover titles such as God Killer and Dragon Killer listed in his interface logs. Astonished, he learns that he supposedly defeated the dragon god Aconcagula in the Dragon's Valley using the Meteor Rain ability. Doubt creeps into Satu's mind as he questions whether he is somehow utilizing hacks in this new world. Arriving at the windmill, Xena provides Satu with insights into its history of attacks and its defensive mechanisms. She also informs him that heroes are summoned in the Saga Empire through a ceremony and particularly fearsome demon lords possess the ability to control demons. During their carriage ride, they come across Ezekuan priests selling so-called divine rocks and inciting the crowd to hurl them at the demi-human children, whom Satu had previously encountered. Xian intervenes, protecting the children with her magic, while Satu covertly investigates the orchestrators behind the chaos using the interface. Exposing the sewer rat guild as the masterminds, Satu divulges their plan to swindle the citizens and incite rebellion. As the citizens question if the priest is the true demon controller, Satu realizes that according to his interface there is a demon present in the city. Suddenly, a four-winged demon with a single eye and two arms emerges from Urz, the master of the slaves, killing him and subsequently dispatching the Zekuan priest. Satu rushes to shield the demi-human slaves from the demon and is relieved to find that their slave status has been lifted, freeing them from Earth's control. The one-eyed demon casts a wide-area magic spell, 
and the scene transitions to Setu opening his eyes, finding himself in a dungeon-like labyrinth. From the demon's piercing voice, Setu learns that they must find the exit to escape. Before continuing, he gives new names to the three slaves who accompany him, naming them Lisa, the lizard girl, Tama, the cat girl, and Panchi, the dog girl. Setu provides them with new clothes, medicine, and food, though initially hesitant, they gratefully accept. Utilizing the interface, Satu discovers that the demon is not within the labyrinth and gains a comprehensive understanding of the layout and the locations of everyone present. As Satu prepares to move forward, the three girls express their fear of being left behind. He reassures them, promising that he will journey with them. Assigning each girl a role, their party encounters a bug monster, which Satu effortlessly eliminates by enhancing his shooting skills through the interface. After the bug's demise, Satu harvests materials from his body, maxing out relevant skills in the process. He creates a spear for Liza and removes the chains from Tama and Pochi's collars. Liza also enlightens Satu about the value of monster cores, extracting one from the slain creature and stowing it in a bag before the group continues onward. Satu, acutely aware of the significance of leveling up, astutely allows Liza, Pochi, and Tama to actively engage in battles with the encountered monsters, thereby incrementing their levels. They strategically take occasional breaks amidst their ongoing exploration of the labyrinth. Along their path, Tama stumbles upon a suspicious wall, and Satu swiftly discerns it to be a trap, just as a menacing monster springs forth, attempting to ambush them. Demonstrating quick thinking, Satu deftly hurls the creature into the trap, effectively ensnaring it in the gaping hole. Undeterred, the resilient party presses onward, their valiant efforts leading to the liberation of Viscount Belton and a captive slave trader from their entanglement within web cocoons. As time progresses, they chance upon a fortuitous encounter with Xena, Orna, and a group of soldiers fiercely engaged in battle against a horde of slimes. Eager to contribute to their cause, Satu joins forces with the valiant fighters, employing his formidable skills to aid in the triumphant vanquishment of the grotesque creatures. Engrossed in conversation with the group, a soldier unwittingly opens a treasure chest unwittingly releasing a one-eyed demon from its deceptive guise. Satu's keen perception reveals that the demon had cleverly masqueraded as an innocuous chest, eluding detection until now. Seizing the opportunity to sow chaos, the malevolent demon commences a relentless assault on the soldiers, launching spells of hallucination near Satu. However, defying the odds, Satu resolutely withstands the spell's influence and, in turn, gains a pertinent skill fortifying his resolve. Amidst the pandemonium and the futility of Belton's magic against the formidable demon, Satu resolves to take matters into his own hands. Cunningly exploiting the distraction caused by an approaching monster, he deftly separates from the group, donning a mask and waiting acquired from Martha to conceal his identity. Clad in this clever disguise, Setu artfully reunites with Xena and the others, seamlessly integrating himself into their ranks and contributing to the relentless pursuit of victory over the demon. However, just as success appears within grass, the one-eyed demon summons its master, the demon lord, hailing from the inner circle of the fearsome demon king. The level 62 demon lord swiftly devours its subordinate and unleashes a ferocious tempest of wind magic causing all present to falter. Unfazed by the challenge before him, Satu fearlessly confronts the demon lord, who arrogantly mocks him for lacking the title of hero and the ability to wield the holy sword. Driven by sheer determination, Satu capitalizes on his profound understanding that magic proves formidable against demonic adversaries. Thus, he maximizes the potential of his fire shot spell, a potent alternative to the perilous meteor rain. Armed with a mystical staff, Satu channels his inner strength, unleashing an infernal barrage of fire shots that relentlessly pummel the demon lord, inflicting substantial damage upon the malevolent entity. As the cataclysmic battle rages on, an epiphany dawns upon Satu, realizing that if the possession of the hero title, which he lacks, enables one to vanquish godlike beings with the holy sword, his own titles of god-killer and ownership of a divine blade should wield a similar effect. Harnessing this newfound revelation, Satu executes a graceful, effortless maneuver swiftly and definitively slaying the demon lord. The scene seamlessly transitions as Satu leads Liza, Pochi, and Tama to the slave trader to facilitate the transfer of their ownership. Along the way, Zemet tenderly approaches Satu, embracing him with unadulterated joy, expressing her profound relief at his safety. Within this tender embrace, Satu's observant gaze alights upon Zena's array of titles, prompting him to acknowledge his own acquisition of such distinctions. Contemplating this significant moment, he silently laments his delayed attainment of the hero title. Finally arriving at the slave trader's presence, Liza Pochi and Tama exuberantly acknowledge Satu as their esteemed new master. In a serendipitous twist, the slave trader introduces Lulu and Arisa, who have now also become entrusted to Satu's care as his valued slaves. Upon hearing Arisa's correct pronunciation of his name and her reaction to the mention of spiders in their hair in Japanese, Satu becomes suspicious and decides to take both Lulu and Arisa as slaves. After introducing themselves, Satu takes the five girls to enjoy a feast as it becomes apparent that they were poorly fed as slaves. They happily devour the delicious food, including sheep entrails, liver, and heart. 
Arisa even admires the cute sight of Pochi and Tama eating. While the girls continue eating, Setu goes out to purchase new clothes for them and some grilled chicken as a snack. On his way back, he encounters hungry demi-human children and kindly gives them the grilled chicken. The scene transitions to Setu and the five girls back at the inn. Realizing that there are no available rooms and that the other guests look down on slaves, Setu uses Arisa's magic to secure the stable as a sleeping space for Liza, Pochi, and Tama. After ensuring their comfort by creating comfortable mattresses from hay, Setu returns to his room to sleep. However, he is surprised to find both Lulu and Arisa standing naked in front of him. Setu reassures them that there is no need to go to such extremes and that he would never request such actions from them. As this awkward moment passes, Setu wakes up in the middle of the night to find a naked Arisa using psychic and charm magic on him. Quickly utilizing the interface, he maximizes his resistance and employs the master-slave contract to order Arisa to cancel all her magic and refrain from casting any more spells. Statue interrogates Arisa about her actions, learning that she did it because he had not requested her services, and she developed feelings for him due to his Asian characteristics. Arisa reintroduces herself as Tachiban Arisa, a reincarnated person, and reveals that, aside from Lulu's great-grandfather, Satu is the only other Japanese person she has met. Satu realizes that this explains Lulu's Japanese appearance with black hair and eyes. Arisa explains that reincarnated individuals typically die in their previous world and start anew as babies in this world, while summoned individuals remain the same as when they were summoned and are merely transferred. She asks Satu which category he belongs to, to which he explains that he neither reincarnated nor was summoned. Satu shares that he did not possess any special skills or high-level items when he found himself in the wasteland and lacked infinite mana. Curious about Arisa's story, Setu asks if she feels comfortable sharing how she became a slave. Arisa reveals that it happened after she tried to use her knowledge from the old world to improve her country, resulting in another country conquering her homeland. She explains that she and Lulu were only able to escape because a demon appeared and burned down the castle, leading them to encounter the slave trader. The scene transitions as Satu wakes up and finds himself in a misunderstanding when Xena discovers a naked Arisa and hears a mumbling Lulu in the inn's room. Satu clarifies the situation by charming Xena and purchasing her a shawl. Later, Satu is seen with the girls on the street, asking Arisa about Lulu's whereabouts. Arisa informs him that Lulu is resting in the inn due to feeling unwell. Satu provides Arisa with money to buy daily necessities for the girls while explaining to Xena that these girls should not be treated as slaves and that he is only their master because they feel comfortable with it. Xena inquires about Satu's plans for the day and upon learning that he intends to find lodging for himself and the girls, she decides to accompany him to the Odd Jobs Agency. Unfortunately, they are unable to find suitable housing and inform Nady, the worker at the agency, that they will return later. Maddie, sensing Xena's interest in Satu, slyly suggests that the performance floors in the fleece market are great places for a date. Satu reunites with Pochi, Tama, Lisa, and Arisa, praising them for their new clothes. He asks Arisa about her decision to dye her hair blonde, and she explains that purple is considered inauspicious in the area. The group proceeds to the performance floors and makes various purchases along the way. After enjoying a performance, they continue to explore the fleece market. During their stroll, Arisa and Xena engage in a discussion sparked by Arisa's belief that one should fight for their love till the end rather than resorting to death. Xena contemplates these words while gazing at Satu. The scene shifts as Xena encounters her military companions, Lilio, Iona, and Rue, who inform her about their battle against monster ants known as Fang Ants. Meanwhile, Satu hears Pochi scream and rushes to her aid. He is surprised to find Tama holding a dead ant. Just as Satu consults the map on the interface and notices approaching monsters, the city bells ring, signaling a monster attack. Satu sends Arisa with Pochi and Tama to protect the inn, while he, accompanied by Lisa, forms a barricade against flying ants attempting to breach the city's barrier. While fighting off the ants, Satu discovers ants in the Odd Jobs Agency and rushes to assist Nadi. However, before he can intervene, the Odd Jobs manager, an elf, comes to Nadi's rescue. Grateful, Nadi expresses her gratitude and Satu promises to return another time to inquire about new houses for rent. As the sun sets, Satu feels relieved that the city's defense against the attack is successful. Xena approaches him briefly to inform him of her guard duty before departing. Suddenly, a shady-looking guard approaches Satu and Lisa, attempting to swindle them out of the monster cores Lisa has collected, claiming it is mandatory to sell them to the government. Satu outwits the guard by obtaining a receipt with the guard's seal. The scene transitions to Martha's mother treating Satu and the girls to a feast as a token of gratitude for protecting the inn. After the meal, Satu sets off to find a pharmacy to purchase medicine for Lulu. However, on the way, two men who he saved in the labyrinth show their gratitude by taking him to a brothel. After this unexpected encounter, as Setu exits the brothel, a feather from a shadow owl falls upon him. While walking, he encounters shadow-type monsters in a narrow alley and defeats them with his skills. He 
He also comes across a heavily injured wearer at night known as Red Mask, who requests that Satu take care of the elf princess beside him. Satu brings them to Nadi's workplace, breaking into the odd jobs agency as Nadi and the manager are asleep. Upon hearing the commotion, they wake up and meet Satu. He explains the situation, and as the manager looks at the elf's face, he utters the name Mia. Mia's eyes flutter open as she hears her name and catches a glimpse of Satu before murmuring pretty and falling back asleep. Meanwhile, the red mask coughs up blood, prompting Satu and Nadi to search for a priest to heal him. The scene transitions to Arisa throwing a tantrum upon discovering Satu's visit to the brothel. After explaining the misunderstanding to Arisa, Satu gives medicine to Lulu and suggests that she join them at the general store if she feels better. Arriving at the store, Satu inquires about Mia's condition with Nadi. Nadi explains that Mia is suffering from exhaustion due to excessive mana consumption. Nadi also mentions that her manager had used mana and stamina transfer spells on Mia, which should have aided her recovery. Satu uses the interface to examine Mia's status, discovering her full name and age. Nadi suggests that a mana potion could assist in Mia's recovery, but is too expensive. She proposes taking Mia to a place with rich mana, such as the Dragon's Valley, for a quicker recovery. Satu smiles wryly, reflecting on his title as the Conqueror of the Dragon's Valley. Suddenly, he hears weak sounds from upstairs and alerts Nadi. They rush to Mia's room and find her awake. Nadi introduces herself and Satu to Mia. As Mia gazes at Satu, she murmurs, Spirit User. Intrigued, Satu asks Nadi about spirit users. Nadi explains that only those gifted with spirit sight can see spirits. She then offers to cook something for Mia, leaving Satu alone with her. Satu engages Mia in conversation, curious about what spirits are like. Mia describes them as fluffy and sparkly. After leaving the general store, Satu encounters Ponchi, Tama, Arisa, and Yuani studying with the education cards he purchased the previous day. Martha appears and invites them to have lunch. As they dine, Satu shares information about Mia, piquing the girl's interest. They express their desire to meet her, so Satu takes them to the general store. At the store, he leaves Arisa, Pochi, and Tama with Mia on the upper floor while he converses with Nadi and Lulu downstairs. As they sit opposite each other on the sofa, Nadi confirms that Satu is a merchant. He retells his previous story to her, and she asks if Satu is interested in buying a horse-drawn carriage. Nadi reveals that a friend of the store manager is selling one. Just as Setu is about to decline, citing his lack of carriage driving skills, Lulu interjects and reveals that she knows how to drive. Encouraged by this revelation, Setu gives money to Nadi to purchase the carriage. The scene transitions to Setu fulfilling the girl's request to escort Mia back to her home by practicing outdoor camping. During their camping trip, Setu encounters the demi-human children he previously helped in the streets. Grateful, they offer him fruits and Setu reciprocates their kindness by giving them beef jerky. Later, Nadi hands Satu the papers for the carriage. He embarks on a driving lesson with Lulu, discovering that she can speak confidently, particularly when discussing topics of interest like Arisa. As Lulu continuously praises her sister, Satu takes over the reins and maximizes his carriage driving skill through the interface, earning the title of coachman. Suddenly, Satu feels a gaze upon him and spots a shadow owl observing him. The owl follows the carriage which passes by Satu's. Upon returning from the driving lesson and reuniting with Arisa and the others, Setu visits the general store and finds the manager conversing with Mize, the Red Mask. From Mize, Setu learns that Mia was kidnapped by wizards and taken to a place called the Cradle. Mia managed to escape on her own and eventually met up with Mize who aided her in reaching the city. Satu realizes that the manager may have information about Mia's kidnappers but refrains from questioning him as he appears uncomfortable discussing the matter. Suddenly, the girls scream in fear and Setu and the manager rush to their side. They are astonished to discover that the girls were frightened by lightning. As the girls cling to Satu, Lee follows Tama's gaze and becomes alert upon spotting the shadow owl once again. Then the shadowy figure replaces the owl, intensifying the tension in the air. The figure Zen, who shares the same name as the hero in the play at the performance floor, unleashes psychic magic with fear-inducing properties. However, Arisa counters with her own psychic magic, allowing Satu to maximize his fear-resistance skill. As Zen approaches Mia, Satu blocks his path and introduces himself as a merchant. Impressed by Satu's unwavering composure in the face of fear, Zen commends him. Despite Satu's attempts to reason with Zen, their conflict escalates into a battle, with Arisa assisting Satu along the way. The two sides reach a stalemate, and Arisa advises Satu to buy time. Sensing that Arisa may be preparing a unique skill, Satu questions Zen, who is revealed to be an undead king, about his identity. At that moment, Arisa screams for Satu to move aside and launches a powerful strike. Unfortunately, Zen remains unscathed, sustaining only minor damage. Observing Arisa's hair color revert to purple, Zen deduces that she too is a reincarnated individual. Zen warns Satu that if he doesn't want Arisa to become a pawn in the gods, he must prevent her from utilizing this unique skill. Zen then captures Mia and challenges Satu to come to the cradle if he dares to face death. He disappears through a portal on the ground. Instructing Lulu and Lisa to take care of the others, Setu bravely jumps into the portal to rescue Mia. 
The scene shifts as Setu finds himself in a dark realm, void of any map even within the interface. Focusing his concentration, Setu notices numerical codes resembling programming language flash across his skin, causing the domain to shatter. Satu then discovers himself in a castle and hears Zen's astonished voice questioning how Satu bypassed the trial to reach this point. Satu explains that the cradle is akin to a game, but Zen objects to this notion and teleports Satu outside. Now standing in front of a massive white tree named Trezuya's castle, Satu enters the castle and proceeds through its various levels. Realizing that the castle consists of 200 floors, Satu concludes that it is akin to a creation by a devoted fan of Emimorkis. In search of a secret passage, Satu encounters a dryad who offers to transport him to the 100th floor in exchange for mana, which Satu provides with a kiss. On the 100th floor, Satu engages in battles against an iron golem and homunculus no. 7. Emerging victorious, Satu continues his ascent and encounters another segment of the same dryad, who once again demands the same price. Satu agrees and he reaches the 180th floor. Defeating numerous monsters, Satu finally faces Zen, who remarks on Satu's swift progression to the last floor. Satu demands the return of Mia, but Zen tempts him with the lost holy sword Jalarhorn as a reward. Zen summons three iron golems and the remaining homunculi from No, 1 to No, 8, excluding No, 7, who Satu had previously defeated. Additionally, Zen activates a unique skill called Limit Break on everyone, urging them to engage in a thrilling battle to the death. Satu engages in a fierce battle against the empowered golems and homunculi. He successfully defeats the golems and attempts to reason with the homunculi, employing his talk no jutsu technique, but to no avail. After a brief fight, Satu emerges victorious and homunculus no. One pleads with him to fulfill their master's desire. The scene shifts as Zen congratulates Satu on his triumph and presents him with the Jalarhorn. Satu then inquires about Zen's desire. Zen reveals his tragic past, explaining that he too is a reincarnated individual who suffered unjust deaths in both lives due to those in power. After seeking revenge in his current life, Zen embarked on a quest to find a hero capable of ending his immortal existence as the King of the Night. Yearning to be reunited with his family, even in death, Zen beseeches Satu to kill him. Deeply moved by Zen's tragic tale, Satu agrees to his request. Drawing the holy sword, which radiates a magnificent blue glow, Satu strikes Zen, freeing him from his immortality. As Zen passes away contentedly, Satu acquires the title of Cradle's Conqueror. Suddenly, two mysterious orbs of light emerge from Zen's tattered robe, assuring Satu that they will meet again before vanishing. As soon as the orbs disappear, the Cradle initiates its self-destruct sequence. Satu swiftly administers a mana potion to Mia, awakening her. He brings Mia up to speed and after studying the Cradle's controls, discovers that Zen had left a way out for her. Satu rushes with Mia to where the Homunculi are, and after witnessing Mia and the Homunculi teleport to safety, Satu proceeds to rescue Homunculus No. 7. Carrying the unconscious Homunculus, he brings her to the Dryad, who requires seeds and a significant amount of mana to transport them outside. After successfully transporting outside, Satu and the Dryad face an oncoming wave of salt. Running after leaving the Dryad, who assures Setu that she will continue to exist as long as the forest thrives, he reaches a lake just as the salt wave approaches. Remembering Arisa's previous explanation about water expanding as its temperature rises, Setu continuously employs fire shots while running on the lake. By acquiring various titles like Hellfire Master during the process, he manages to survive the salt wave. The scene shifts as Setu reunites with Pochi, Tama, Lisa, Arisa, and Lulu. Comforting the tearful girls, Sutu promises them that he will not engage in any further dangerous endeavors. In the midst of this, Mia and the manager approach Sutu, and Mia formally expresses her gratitude by kissing his forehead. The scene transitions to the homunculi expressing their gratitude to Sutu for sparing their lives. They depart to bury Zen's wedding ring at his wife's grave, leaving homunculus no. 7. Who won in a game of rock-paper-scissors to stay with him. Sutu names her Nana. Once the group returns to the city, Satu reports an altered version of the events to the city defense force. He also comforts Zena, who cries upon their reunion, assuring her not to worry and gifting her the earrings they had seen in the fleece market. The scene shifts as Satu and the group bid farewell to their friends, with Zena even chasing them outside the city on horseback, declaring her intention to join them in the coming spring. Witnessing Satu's melancholy, the girls console him, leading to a playful ruckus in the carriage. The scene transitions, revealing glimpses of broken Tory gates, accompanied by a voice giving a reminder that they will remain together forever and to never forget. Satu and the gang leisurely enjoy their delightful travel, occasionally pausing to rest and indulge in delicious meals. As they find respite in a serene grassy field, Arisa, ever the discerning one, voices her dissatisfaction with the uncomfortable straw cushions in the carriage. Satu, fueled by his resourcefulness, takes it upon himself to enhance their comfort by skillfully sewing leather covers for the cushions, with the enthusiastic assistance of all the girls. Before leaving the idyllic field behind, Arisa introduces Satu to the wonders of item box magic, showcasing its capabilities 
by storing the mouth-watering pancakes lovingly prepared by Liz within its magical confines. The scene then transitions to the gang taking a rest near a magnificent stone outcropping. Satu joyfully engages with Pochi and Tama in playful antics, and to his delight, Arisa joins the lively gathering. However, Satu's attention is soon captivated by Mia's enchanting music as she skillfully plays a melodic tune using a delicate leaf. Inspired, Satu attempts to emulate her harmonious melody, but alas, his efforts fall woefully short. As time passes, Arisa approaches him with a serious look in her eye, leading him towards the nearby stone structures that cause Satu to fall in silence. Suddenly, a surge of recognition floods Satu's mind as he realizes that these structures are none other than the revered Tory Gates. Memories of his childhood days spent playing with a cherished companion at the Tory Gates near his grandfather's house wash over him. Echoes of a young girl referring to him as Ichiru resonate in his mind, accompanied by the unwavering promise of everlasting companionship. Shaking himself from his reverie, Satu is greeted by Arisa's voice, pulling him back to the present. Perplexed by his reminiscing, Satu expresses his confusion to Arisa, who, upon hearing his reference to the Tori Gates as travel gates, wonders if they are similar to the whimsical portals often found in games. Satu humbly admits his lack of knowledge on the subject and instructs Arisa to gather the rest of the group. Once everyone reconvenes, they discover Pochi and Tama proudly presenting the small prey they have skillfully hunted. Unfortunately, Tama's prey escapes due to Arisa's intervention, prompting Satu to comfort the dejected feline and assure her that there is no cause for concern. As hunger begins to stir within the group, they gather together, enjoying a heartwarming meal consisting of the delectable pancakes lovingly prepared by Liz. Amidst the shared feast, Arisa laments the limitations of her item box, expressing her wish that it could keep their food warm. The scene transitions to the gang continuing their journey in the comfort of their carriage. The girls serenade the air with their melodious voices, their harmonies intertwining with the rhythmic sounds of their travel. Satu, fully engrossed in his limitless interface, delves into the depths of magical experimentation, exploring the art of spellcraft, akin to the intricacies of programming languages used in the creation of captivating games. Along their path, they chance upon a slave trader carriage and valiantly come to the rescue of Mize's loyal Ratmen friends, who had aided Mia in her daring escape. The Ratmen, overwhelmed with gratitude, express their heartfelt appreciation to Satu and the company, seeking permission to forge ahead as they have unfinished business to attend to. With a reassuring nod from Satu, he assures them that they will meet again in due time. For their evening repast, Satu assists Tama in skillfully hunting down a magnificent deer, ensuring a feast fit for royalty. As night falls, the weary gang settles down to rest, with the girls drifting into peaceful slumber. Satu, ever vigilant, utilizes the solitude of the night to delve deeper into his interface inventory, uncovering invaluable insights into its workings. He discovers the peculiar nature of stored items, realizing that they remain unaltered within the interface inventory, frozen in time while within the item box, the passage of time leaves its mark on stored objects. Morning breaks, accompanied by a nourishing breakfast that fuels the gang for their continued journey. Satu and his company rendezvous with Mize and the other Ratmen, paying their solemn respects at the gravesite of the fallen Ratmen heroes who had sacrificed their lives to aid Mia in her escape. Mia, ever attunes the harmonies of nature as an elf, beseeches the tree that stands over the sacred gravesite to grant peace to the spirits of the departed heroes. During this bittersweet farewell, Mize bestows upon Satu the revered silent bell of Bolnin, recognizing him as a trusted friend of Mizanaria. As both parties bid each other goodbye, Satu's eyes catch sight of a similar bell adorning Mia's attire, deepening the mysterious connection between them. Satu is eating in a tavern when he witnesses an argument between a customer and the tavern owner. Feeling generous, Satu decides to treat everyone in the tavern and leaves a tip for the waitress. As he gets up to leave, the waitress grabs his arm and invites him to spend the night in a private room. The next morning, Arisa and Mia scold Satu for spending the night with a girl. Arisa expresses her dissatisfaction at being left out. The scene transitions to the gang continuing their journey and encountering the same officer, who previously tried to steal their cores, mistreating a commoner. Satu intervenes and helps the commoner by providing a magic potion to heal him. Arisa remarks that Satu should ensure they have enough potions for themselves as well. This comment sparks Satu's interest in alchemy, prompting him to decide to learn the skill. He practices alchemy by following the instructions on his interface, successfully creating his first potion and acquiring the alchemy skill. Satu then maximizes his proficiency in alchemy through the interface and uses a transmutation table to create a high-quality potion. However, he realizes that specialized vials are required for potion storage, and since he's running low on materials, Satu decides to take the group to the nearby Nuki town in Kohanu County. As night falls, Satu decides to work on crafting a magic item while keeping watch. Arisa joins him and he gives her a simple magic item that circulates mana in a continuous loop. Arisa demonstrates how to use it, and Satu attempts to do the same. Unfortunately, his immense mana causes the magic item to explode, startling the girls awake. Satu calms them down and the scene transitions to the gang traveling to Nuki Town. 
Using the interface map, Satu discovers several uncharted areas and decides to explore them alone. Upon reaching the town, Satu and Lisa inquire with the locals about the location of an alchemy shop. They learn the address and Satu heads there. However, as he approaches the shop, he notices a suspicious cloaked man leaving. Satu enters the shop and meets Lenmaris, the owner. Lemuris reveals that stabilizers for potions are in short supply due to their reliance on cores, which Satu happens to possess. She also mentions that someone has recently bought out her stock of vials, but she suggests he could buy them directly from the pottery shop. Satu expresses his interest in purchasing magic scrolls, and Lemuris agrees to sell them in exchange for the cores, which are apparently illegal to trade. Sending Lisa back to the girls, Setu returns to the alchemy shop in disguise and sells Lenmaris the magic cores, enabling him to acquire the scrolls. As night falls, Setu uses the scrolls to learn their associated skills and explores one of the uncharted areas on his map. He discovers that passing through a barrier leads him into the Forest of Illusions. While exploring the forest, Setu encounters an aggressive girl named Ininamana, the assistant of the witch residing in the forest. Satu skillfully avoids Ininamana's attacks, and the old witch appears, greeting him as the ambassador of Bolnan due to the Bell of Bolnan. She takes Satu to her tower, where she apologizes for Ininamana's actions. Satu forgives Ininamana, who joins them in the room. After this incident, the witch shares information with Satu about her agreement with the Count of Kohanu to deliver 300 vials of a special potion in exchange for the forest's protection. Seeing Satu's interest in alchemy, the witch teaches him a recipe for a special potion and asks him to deliver a letter to the giant of the forest in return. Satu agrees and returns to the town, where he visits the pottery workshop owner. In the process, he overhears two suspicious individuals discussing their nefarious plans. The pottery workshop owner offers to teach Satu pottery, and he agrees to learn the skill. The scene transitions to the following morning when Satu and the girls rush to help in an amana, who is being pursued by unknown individuals. Satu assists in an amana, but unfortunately, the potions she was carrying get broken. Setu accompanies her to assistant Viceroy Birkins and negotiates a deal to replace 180 of the 300 broken potions. Setu recognizes Birkins' voice and officer who previously swindled him and realizes that these two are the suspicious individuals from last night. With his sharp wit, Setu skillfully negotiates with the officer and the Viceroy to ensure the remaining potions are delivered by the next morning. After leaving the office, in Inamana reminds Setu about the potion vial and he realizes that the Viceroy has set a trap for him. Satu resourcefully enlists the assistance of the skilled pottery workshop owner to craft the delicate vials, while the girls eagerly lend their hands in the process. The owner stands in awe of Satu's rapid mastery and his ability to produce such a multitude of vials. However, a new concern arises. The crucial matter of drying them as a hasty kiln placement without proper drying could lead to catastrophic explosions. Grinning mischievously, Satu swiftly conjures a new spell on the spot, aided by Mia, effectively and promptly drying the vials. Undeterred by the challenge, the determined gang perseveres diligently until evening, carefully arranging all the necessary vials in the kiln. Just as they complete this task, Satu's keen senses detect the approach of the conniving officer, accompanied by his intimidating and courage. With Dex stealth, Satu covertly stores all the vials within the kiln into his interface inventory. As expected, the officer arrogantly obliterates the kiln, citing the illegality of producing vials without governmental permission. Little does he know that the shards he destroys are merely cleverly crafted decoys inserted by Satu. Content with his deception, the officer departs the scene. Apologies are exchanged between the workshop owner and Satu, both acknowledging the unfortunate turn of events. Satu then discreetly informs the girls of his covert action, revealing to Arisa a secret surpassing even her esteemed item box. Employing his item box and inventory in perfect harmony, Satu skillfully manipulates the vial's temperature, ensuring their structural integrity remains intact amidst sudden temperature fluctuations. Elation sweeps through the gang as they rejoice in the knowledge that the delivery to the Viceroy can now proceed as planned. The scene seamlessly transitions to Satu's valiant attempt to garner the Viceroy's attention and obtain his signature on the delivery papers. Despite completing a thorough inspection of the potions, which meet the highest standards, a Viceroy dismisses Satu's presence, ignoring his request and refusing to sign. Just then, a timely arrival unfolds as Count Kohanu, accompanied by the witch, graces the office. Hain, enlightened by this unexpected turn of events, realizes the purpose behind Satu's communication with the witch through the slumbering familiar resting upon her head. The Count, brimming with disdain for the Viceroy's negligence, proceeds to reprimand him and ultimately declares his dismissal. A sudden assault ensues when Perkins, driven by his greed, launches a town protection spell against the Count, only to be met with resolute resistance. Count Kohanu boldly asserts his jurisdiction over the town, reminding Perkins of the futility of his spell. Seizing the moment, the Count proclaims his intent to grant Perkins a swift demise due to his familial connection. 
Witnessing this perilous exchange, Satu springs into action, swiftly immobilizing both the officer and Perkins. With unwavering conviction, Satu reminds the Count of the presence of innocent children within the confines of the office. The Count, acknowledging the nobility as character, commends the witch for having such a friend. The scene gracefully transitions to Satu and the gang bidding farewell to the town, their departure accompanied by heartfelt expressions of gratitude from the witch, Ein, and the potter, who receives a new kiln courtesy of the Count's generosity. Amidst their continued journey, a serene morning brings forth a ruckus as Setu skillfully adjusts Nana's foundational system, necessitating the placement of hands upon her heart. Furthermore, Setu pens a heartfelt letter to Zina, recounting the trials and triumphs of his journey thus far. As the night envelops them, Pokey beseeches Setu to share a bedtime story, presenting him with a book. Setu graciously acquiesces, captivating the girls with the enthralling tale of the Nine Gods. Among their divine ranks, the resplendent dragon god, existing even before the emergence of the other seven, takes his rightful place as the Eight, the Ninth Deity, a malevolent demon god hailing from a distant realm, introduces a grave challenge to humans. The humans beseech for power to combat the demon race created by this nefarious entity from the other gods. Answering this plea, the compassionate young goddess approaches the dragon god, beseeching him for aid. Because of his love for human wine and various toys, the dragon god bestows upon her a singular spell, the hero summons. Energized by this revelation, the next morning finds Setu and the company brimming with joy and determination as they eagerly resume their journey, savoring a delightful breakfast along the way.